Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experience here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome back to everybody I recognize, everybody who's joined us before. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of the trolley era, our collection that you can enjoy from home, usually on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And we're gonna continue these programs as long as we have presenters. So if you have a show that you'd like to share that fits um, our museum mission, please let me know. That would be anything about Pennsylvania, the trolley era, or uh, cities where our streetcars come from. And if you have a program that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, please reach out anyway. And you can see a full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org which I can share in the chat box in just a minute or two. We have, we have our um, previous programs online as well, and you can watch all the recordings of those. Um, right now, we do not have any scheduled past tonight, except for part two of this presentation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, we're working on getting presenters. There's a few lined up for this summer, and I'll put those on the website as soon as they're available. And I want to extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated when registering for tonight's program and those who have made donations through our website. We really, really appreciate your support of this program. So uh, most of you know about the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, so I won't spend too long on this slide, but we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by some enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened to, the, uh, to visitors a few years later in 1963. We're actually located along the route of the trolley line uh, between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. Uh, you'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars here, about 20 of them run. And last year we had over 30,000 visitors take the four mile scenic ride at the museum. And a couple updates for you guys. It was so nice to see many of you last Saturday at our members day. Um, we had some interim East Campus project dedications that we did. And on the left, you'll see Trolley Street here, uh, actually now called Volunteer Boulevard. And you can see everybody seated underneath the canopy there. And on the right hand side, relevant to this program is a McKeesport traffic light. So though the city of McKeesport uh, gave us some of these traffic lights and you'll see our new street signs there as well, Allegheny Avenue, Volunteer Boulevard. We had a ribbon cutting for our new ADA compliant high level platform, which allows people to access three different Philadelphia cars. So the Almond Joy car there on the left and behind it, the bullet car, and then a freight motor um, kind of behind the third gentleman from the left's head uh, and that will, it's a giant ramp you can see on the right there and it lets people go inside and there's still a little bit more that we have to add to that. But um, we're very excited that that is mostly complete now. Uh, there's another photo of it on the left there. It shows you how you can walk straight into the car. It's really, really neat. Um, we all saw it and immediately thought, hey, this is a future events rental space. So I can't wait for everybody to come check it out. It's like a whole new museum in there, especially with the lights. Um, it's really neat. Um, on the right, you'll see some of our volunteers. We present the um, President's Volunteer Service Awards here at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, and this recognizes volunteer service on a national level. So on the right side here is a group of volunteers who served between 100 and 250 hours at the museum. And in these photos on the left, we have our volunteers from 250 to 500 hours, the silver level, and the gold level on the right, that's over 500 hours. So in total last year at the museum, we had about 27,600 hours of volunteer service. So uh, we're very happy to celebrate the volunteers and uh, we had a nice dinner as well. A couple more photos along Volunteer Boulevard. On the left, we have Falcone Plaza right after the fountain turned on. You can't see it, but it is turned on <laughs> here. And we've got the clock working and um, uh, part of the family is there high-fiving each other, some of the younger ones. And on the right is a photo from Father Jack Demian of uh, evening operations along Volunteer Boulevard. And you can see the, uh, I, think, I believe 33,000 uh, bricks there, Brick Paved Street and the Safety Island and the Bullnose. Uh, it's all coming together. It's very exciting. And lastly, we have some more exciting things along the street, including these kind of gothic street light, street lamps. Um, we've got a couple more of those potentially coming. 
And on the right side is the north facing entrance of the new Welcome and Education Center, some of the architectural um, entryway going in there. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, and then the very last thing I wanted to mention, our friends at the East Penn Traction Club, their meet is coming up. It's just around the corner, May 19th, 20th, 21st. So if you would like to check that out, please do so. Um, the information is eastpen.org. Okay. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, George Gula. George grew up in Philadelphia and Scranton, developing his trolley interests at a young age in Philadelphia. After graduating from Penn State with a degree in business logistics, he spent his entire career working in the transit business, first in Scranton and then in Pittsburgh, where he worked from 1975 until his retirement in 2018. Or is it 2008? Which was yeah, it? Yeah, eight. Oh, wait. Okay, I got to oh, end that. <laughs> he joined the museum in 1975, or as he says, a long time ago, and currently serves as an operator and a conductor. He also volunteers in the archives and gives lots of outreach programs like this one, and he's been writing for our member newsletter since 1977. All right, at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with the presenter, but the chat box will be open throughout, so please feel free to enter uh, questions and comments during the show, and we can read through those at the end, and George always requests a copy at the end, too, so if you have notes to add to a slide, feel free to type those in, too. You'll notice that a lot of George's slides do have text at the bottom, but he usually will uh, talk about the text, so you don't need to, don't feel the read, need to read the text. All right, um, this program is being recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube at a later date. At this time, let's go ahead, turn off our videos um, and please keep your microphones muted during the presentation just so we can minimize distractions. Uh, all right, George, if you're ready, take it away. Uh, let's see, is it a share screen? Yes, that's we'll three We'll button. stop others screen sharing. Do I want to continue? Yes. All right, we're gonna stop other, other screen sharing. This looks like where I need to be now. Where is my, <clears throat> let me, Kristen, I need to make sure my program is up. I see it here. Um, okay. There. Okay. Now I can hit uh, play. Yes. And hopefully we're at the beginning, right? Oh, we are in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Looking for everything up here. Here. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Hit the new tab. All right, where am I again? <laughs> oh, did you lose the? Uh... Well, yeah, it wants me to launch the meeting. Oh, we don't. We're already in the meeting. So well, I know. Can... I know that. I know that. Uh, Navigate back I can, to your. Let's uh... see. And resume right, share. I... Hit yep. play. Yeah. Okay. Now, can you? Uh... Yes, and I can see your let's cursor see as well. Oh, good. Good. And I have all this stuff on the top, but I guess that doesn't matter for other people. They won't see it. So, so hi, folks. And uh, I, don't, I can't see all of you, of course, but it's uh, great to be here again. Uh, Kristen mentioned there's going to be a part two, and that's true because uh, uh, I guess having the very lengthy but excellent show last uh, month, you know, they wanted to reduce the time spent here. Uh, so I cut this apart and we will head down from Pittsburgh uh, on Route 68, which served Kennywood, of course, and many of the steel mills, uh, and wander around uh, 98 Glassport. Uh, and next week, we'll uh, leave Pittsburgh and uh, ride the Route 56, which is the fast way to Pittsburgh. Uh, I was able to, of course, put all this in. And a lot of people, I probably missed somebody here, uh, but a lot of people took pictures, some of which are in our archives, some are not. Um, and of course, a number of our uh, foundations and museums. So I just wanted to put that up. Now, what we'll be looking at today then, uh, if I can find uh, Forbes Avenue was 68. And uh, of course, 68's wandering up through Squirrel Hill, Forbes Avenue. Um, it will head down Murray, cross the Homestead High Level Bridge. Here is Homestead. Uh, past all the mills through Munhall and uh, Whitaker, and uh, eventually we'll get into Kennywood Park, um, down on the Hamilton Avenue to Duquesne, and finally 
Uh, and there were several ways to get into McKeesport, and uh, we'll explain it. Glassport was a nice little short line. Basically went from about here, Pearl Street Loop, uh, down to Ohio Street on Monongahela and on West 5th. But at one time, it went all the way up to East Pittsburgh. And Wilmerding, and I have no photos um, of that, sorry, um, and just a little bit better map of what we're looking at. This is the 1955 map, and of course, some track is gone in McKeesport because all the yellow cars were gone as well. Now, how did Route 68 get started? It, be, it was the Squirrel Hill Railroad, which was chartered in 1863, wanted to develop uh, Squirrel Hill. It was supposed to go on uh, Bouquet from uh, Fifth. It would later begin at uh, Forbes. And uh, uh, it was incorporated for the small number of 999 years. <laughs> um, and uh, if you can see it, there's where we left it. It would go down into Panther Hollow and up alongside of what is now the CMU powerhouse and right through the middle of CNU. Uh, John Kerr and Margaret Morrison, Cross Forbes, a lot of private right away. And it was supposed to wander over to Homewood and um, down over in this direction. So uh, it, it, it had a lot of uh, potential, but <clears throat> they didn't want to go there. Here's a picture some of you may have seen. Uh, down in Panther Hollow, that was the bridge they built going over the B&O. There's a big parking lot down here now and a number of apartments. Um, but it was not a very, they started laying track, was not very successful, of course, and it got sold. Uh, a man named Thomas Noble bought it for uh, some somewhat under $10,000, and he chartered the Shenley Park and Highland Street Railway in 1891. So it can continue building the line. Now, this had some problems because, you know, we all heard of Mary Shenley and Mary Shenley, of course, uh, a local girl who moved to England. She donated a lot of land uh, to create Pittsburgh Shenley Park. Uh, she also donated land. Um, he gave her consent for a dollar to go across um, a trolley to go across Shenley Park or parts of what would become Shenley Park. And there was a man named Edward M. Bigelow and he became chief of public works. Bigelow Boulevard is named for this gentleman. And he did not like the fact that the tracks were going through his park. He tried desperately to get rid of it, went to court. We'll see that in a minute. Um, and finally, when the Forbes Avenue bridge opened, uh, United Traction was already running over that way. And he brokered a deal with United Traction to allow this system to use the bridge and tracks on Forbes Avenue. Here's CMU today, um, but you can see um, the tracks running along John Keir. This is what they did. John Keir Street and Woodlawn would become part of Margaret Morrison. So they actually ran through CMU campus before, of course, it was a campus. Now, there's a broader uh, map of this. Uh, there had been an injunction, a court case, you know, Bigelow tried to stop the streetcars in July of 1892, and it didn't work. Uh, they pulled up some track, uh, and it went to court. Um, well, the judge said, you know, you could lay this railway, uh, you can't pull the track up. Meanwhile, Noble changed his routing. Um, he decided instead of going off in the Homewood, he was going to go down, all the way down to Murray Avenue and eventually tried to get down into Homestead, Homestead. So right here is where the ferry would be. Today, this is all apartments on uh, Parkview, Parkview Boulevard, um, becomes Beachwood here. So, but it's hard to see that on the map. There's a, a better map of the track, uh, which wound its way over private right away, very steep uh, up where Beachwood Boulevard is. And then, you know, over into Murray Murray Avenue. Here's Greenfield. And uh, so we're talking the 1890s, 93, uh, 94. And uh, there was some right away up here in this area right now. So it's the red that we're looking at. That is the Shenley Park and Highlands. So meanwhile, there's something else going on this side of the river or on the south side of the river. And that's the yellow line. That's another railway, the Homestead and Highlands Street Railway. 
Um, it's also chartered for 999 years because we're all going to live forever. Um, it's going to run out of Homestead and up into what was then Mifflin Township, what is today uh, West Mifflin. And one of the requirements was you had to run streetcars within two years. OK, it, it didn't matter. You could extend your own tracks into the city, make a connection with another car line. Uh, but you had to get into the city at least as far as Oakland. OK, now, meanwhile, Shenley Park and Highlands, which had been chartered as a steam railroad, is still running under the steam charter and it needs trackage rights to get the homestead. OK, uh, there's a new bridge that's been constructed that would be the old low level bridge. So I'd like to see all the political engineering, uh, but some of the Shenley Park and Highland people managed to get elected to the uh, um, the Homestead and Highlands board. Um, and then they could uh, they get majority control of the line and uh, they start, you know, actually getting a foundation at this point to get a through line. Uh, but, you know, all the deals are being brokered so that you could do that. Uh, in the meantime, there's the Braddock and Homestead, which will allow people coming across the uh, Rankin Bridge or what we know now as the Rankin Bridge um, to also uh, reach those cars. And this is all starting to happen. By 1895, they're operating um, as one entity. OK, and that's going to be gobbled up by Monongahela Street Railway, number one. There were several uh, of them also chartered for 999 years in 1898. It's built by the Mellons and it wanted to construct the line throughout the uh, Monongahela and Turtle Creek Valley. So it, whatever it had to do, it would gobble up subsidiary companies or build its own railway uh, so it could have one uh, big consolidated system. And before anybody asks, I have no idea where the hell this picture is taken. Um, so now you have this, you have, it's absorbed. It absorbs the she, uh, Shenley Park in the Highland. Um, and it also absorbs uh, the homestead in Highland. And, uh, you know, it couldn't legally merge it. So they make an agreement with United Traction. Monongahela gets the, operates its cars over United Track from Forbes to Woodland. Okay, that's around Margaret Morrison. Um, and they merge all these companies uh, to form what is then the Monongahela Railway Company number two. Um, they still haven't gone over to Braddock. They haven't gone over to Oakmont, which they'll do. Um, but now you'll be able to have a line at least down into Duquesne. And they'll have to negotiate, of course, with West Penn Railway. Um, but they've acquired all these lines. And uh, you can see a very simplified map here. There's Kennywood. There's the end of their line because from the railroad station in Duquesne, they're going to have to dicker with uh, white traction, which becomes West Penn Railways by that time uh, to get into McKeesport. Um, now, just I had this in another show, but you get to see how big the Monongahela Street Railway is. It's operating you know, up into Wilkinsburg, it's down into Braddock on this side. It's, you know, heading down towards Turtle Creek in East Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, it's a rather big system. Now, that system stays together one week. Then it's released to the Consolidated Traction on January 1, 1902. And we all know that is also the day Pittsburgh Railways Company uh, was established or started operating. And so you really want to take a look at the red, the red line up here now from downtown via Forbes, via Murray, um, and then down the private right of way across the low bridge. This area is known as the Wart. It's over 1,100 families living down there. There are churches, there are schools. Uh, most of us remember that as uh, a steel company, steel mill, and Younger people remember this as the waterfront. And then it will just, uh, you know, the line here is the McKeesport line. Here's the Rankin Bridge right here, which is built by the Monongahela Street Railway. Here's the line through Kennywood, through Duquesne. And here in the dotted line is the West Penn Railway's track over Jerome Avenue. They will affect a, uh, a deal. Uh, so that they could use that. Ed Leibarger said they were supposed to pay West Penn, uh, but they never did. 
Uh, don't ask me what happened there. They would eventually go to Verona and Oakmont. And I found this bottom thing. And I thought it was funny. It was in a newspaper. They they earned three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. The Mellon family got this every year uh, because the lease. Well, that's what you did. You rented the railway, essentially. Um, and in 1944, that was a scandalous newspaper clipping uh, that they were still making money, doing nothing, owning nothing, running nothing. Uh, during the bankruptcy proceedings, uh, which set Pittsburgh Railways loose from Philadelphia Company, finally, um, that that lease was uh, was eliminated. I'm going to show a few downtown shots, uh, and I'm using 56 too, and you'll see this next week as well, but all of the, or two weeks from now, but everything came in on Forbes Avenue. And they, that Forbes Avenue then was Diamond Street. Um, it would swing over Stanwick Street about a block, and then it would head out of town on Fourth Avenue. And uh, of course the, the 60s would reach Fourth to Forbes um, Avenue. And I know somebody said, yeah, sometime they use Third Avenue, but you know, we're not going to do a little match where we see every little street and every little, little year. Uh, people like this slide if I show this publicly because a lot of people remembered the National Record Mart near Market Square where you could buy records, tapes, and I spent time there and I'm sure a lot of you did. Uh, that was one of the places you passed and you went under the market house and behind that there's the new diamond market um, and I think that was Murphy's and you could go in and there was a whole section uh, uh, relegated to food, which some of you may think, yeah, I like that. And I did very much. You can buy some cooked stuff or you could buy fresh stuff there. Market House uh, was one of those that was torn down. Um, it was abandoned. And by 1961, they, they just said, let's take it down. And there it is. Uh, the Diamond Market, I believe they did bowling up on the top is one of the things there. Uh, there was McDonald's at one time over on the left. That's no longer there. Um, and Robert Holy. Look at Robert Holy is in the market house. And it would eventually become a huge place um, down in the strip district. And then we'll squeal around the curve. Um, that's the cigar stores where McDonald's was located. And I believe that's closed now. And we'll on Stanwix for a block. And now we're up on to 4th, 4th Avenue. And this is Smithfield Street. And uh, I've told people who might see this slide that are parts of the public, you know, that that the PCCs, we, that Pittsburgh Railways participated in their development and the first one arrived here in 37 and, you know, then we got, or 36, pardon me, uh, and then we got our first 100 of 666 cars uh, in 1937. Well, now we're going to head out on Forbes. This is the 68. They're, they're going up into what's known as Uptown. They've just, you know, passed the courthouse, passed the jail, and uh, over, we'll see what's over on the right in a minute, but Uptown, Fisher Scientific was there. I believe one of our members worked there um, early on when I arrived in the 70s. That track, as you can look at over on the uh, right, is really the T-Now. It's all covered over. There's the Panhandle Bridge. Um, on the left, you see the Liberty Bridge um, ramps dropping down out of Forbes uh, and a car moving outbound. And who knows if it's a 68 or 67 or we don't know, but it represents it. And the Pennsylvania Railroad had a freight house and they had team tracks. Um, and you can see a truck right there in the middle unloading uh, from a boxcar. Uh, Armstrong Tunnels. All the cars pass the Armstrong Tunnels. They're on the right. It's one of Art S., uh, Arthur S. L. Sr.'s photographs. And then this is what Uptown looked like. It was a lot of homes. This is Forbes. So there were small stores, more stores, many more stores were located on Fifth Avenue, a block over uh, to the left. Um, I'm sure that this picture was taken when the hump was being taken down or, or Grants Hill. Uh, a lot of congestion and you know i just always notice that motorist and they're coming the wrong way as you can see and, you know just like pittsburgh drivers today they're pretty wild uh, by the 20s yeah it was kind of hard to get out to uh out to anywhere and this is typical traffic congestion in pittsburgh um i assume before traffic control um 
first found this sh uh, photo, I didn't know. I thought it was the 20s, but apparently somewhere it says 1928. There is another great shot of Uptown. Uh, we're heading out now and coming to the Brady Street Bridge Boulevard of the Allies over on the left. Um, there are tracks on the Brady Street Bridge, I believe 7754 uh, used that. And that, of course, now is a new bridge known as the Birmingham Bridge. Here's the original end of the Boulevard of the Allies, though. It came out of town, you know, cut through Chinatown and uh, does what it does today, except, of course, there's no highway interchanges for the parkway. There's no continuance out to Squirrel Hill. It just dumped everything here um, on Forbes Avenue. And I left this in to show you that from the other direction. We got high floor cars, low floor cars, and a low floor trailer, um, all swinging off uh, at the head in the town. And out a little bit farther, uh, there's the Birmingham or the, the old Brady Street Bridge crossing. Um, and you can see the black buildings, I believe, are some of the JNL buildings. Now you'll see 67, 66 is, you know, we're looking at location um, where the car ran because nobody's ever going to get enough Route 68s or Route 64s. Boulevard of the Allies Bridge, as we swing around to the Gulf, I believe, a no-knock uh, sign up there. We'll pass Craft Avenue. And uh, the hospital today, I think McGee Hospital uh, was there. There's a nice, you almost think I had a drone. Um, a nice shot of Oakland. Remember, Forbes Avenue was two-way, Fifth Avenue was two-way. Uh, and the trolleys are running two-way. And I, I can't imagine, look at the cramped parking and knock so many buildings out uh, as we start to get into South Oakland uh, for parking, university parking, I suspect, maybe baseball parking, because there is uh, Forbes Field, appeared in Angels in the Outfield. Iroquois Building is another landmark in Oakland. It's uh, believe around Atwood Street. And uh, that building is now owned by the University of Pittsburgh and they have converted it into dorms. They've left the facade. Uh, they were very, very conscious of that being a, a, an Oakland landmark and, and that's what they did. Um, and I think with the interurban car here, this probably uh, baseball game day and, and the game is done uh but uh we're at atwood street and don't forget a car came in from south oakland and it stopped at forbes and atwood that was a shuttle running through south oakland well yellow cars serve that exclusively now there's gustine's gustine's was a bar and a restaurant i've been told there was very good food there um the original is over on the left before it expanded and got bigger. And I can remember some of my first Pittsburgh cheesesteaks at the original. They weren't really too bad. The university dorms, uh, which were the Shenley apartments, I believe back there. Um, here is where the Hillman Library will be, but now it's a gas station and they sell uh, used cars and they also park cars. And this has been used in the World War II slide to illustrate both the old and the new cars running together. Don't forget the yellow cars had been speeded up during the thirties or many of them had, and were able to keep up with the PCC. So oops, fast finger. Um, yeah, the, the, the negative is about as good as you could see, but I thought when I saw the Shenley Park Hotel, now the University of Pittsburgh uh, Student Center, and uh, it's a 7754 and, and a 69 or a 68 passenger would see this. Um, there's the used cars in the parking. You can see the uh, Carnegie Library looking down Forbes. Uh, behind that streetcar is something that's no longer there. It's the Shenley Theater. It was a movie theater uh, up there. And it's your typical uh, Pittsburgh safety alley. Move down a little bit and uh, we're opposite the, ah, I got to say this right, Tower of Learning, because I'm a Penn State graduate and there's all sorts of names for that out there and uh, bad habits die hard. 
And there is the Tower of Learning again. There is Forbes Field. Uh, there are streetcars uh, in both directions, I'm sure. One is the 68 um, moving along through the education section of Oakland. And uh, there we are. It's a nice day out there. It's a flying fraction car. But the 68s ran out here too. Dick Boker uh, is a member who's unfortunately passed away. And he worked up on the higher part of the Tower of Learning and he was able to take many shots of cars on Fifth Avenue, but he also took this one. And we are now looking towards CMU. We're looking uh, towards Squirrel Hill. Um, there again is the Carnegie Library. Um, we'll cross the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad past at least what is now the Bureau of Mines. We're entering Sun, uh, Carnegie Mellon University territory, and it's a great shot, of course, of the uh, of the university tower, uh, some of the hospitals out there in the back. Um, and I mean, for people who, of course, don't know this, I found this PC she shot, and here's Beeler Street and uh, the parking garage, East parking garage is here, and then Margaret Morrison will be there as well up here. And I just, you know, you could read that when when the cars were assigned. And for uh, Route 68, uh, they came on November 14th, 1937. Now, 69 was a short route, went down Murray Avenue only as far as Celine Street. Okay, the top of the hill before you go down to Beachwood Boulevard. And that got uh, PCCs a little bit earlier on October 26th of 1937. And you can see that with the 37 date, all the heavy 60s got PCCs uh, relatively quickly. They were heavy routes. Uh, and there are students boarding at another safety island. People hit these safe safety islands right, left. Uh, Margaret Morrison Street. And right here is where the Shenley Park and Highland, when it was running through CMU or CMU property at that, what is now CMU property, left the park and joined Forbes Avenue. Okay, And I found this and it's looking the other way, but it was amazing because I could not figure out where that last picture was till I found this. Uh, and you went out there and I took a look and some of that stonework is still there, not the shelter. Uh, but certainly the stone wall. And so I was able to identify the last one. Now, not everybody has a good camera, as you can see. And, uh, but we're very, very grateful for these images. Um, here's a midday, probably a midday or a Sunday car. These PCCs were assigned to base service, evening service, and uh, certainly they were out on the holidays. But when the rush hour came, uh, you also had your choice of waiting for one of these. Now, I know all of us would want to get on one of these, but I'm not sure whether the public was really excited about it unless it was snowing. And then in which case I would probably get onto anything that came. It's a residential area as we move up the hill, Forbes Avenue, that's Northumberland Street in the back. Um, and we will be entering Squirrel Hill right about here. Um, doesn't look very much different today. I think that's building as part of the golf uh, golf course. And we will run through oh, about half a mile, three quarter mile of residential. This is Whiteman Street, uh, just a block from Murray Avenue. 64 car sitting in for a 68 car. Look the other way and you'll see a crossing guard here. Uh, and a typical uh, typical home. Some are still there. Uh, some have been uh, knocked down and have been replaced with more modern apartments. And when I showed Kristen this photo earlier, she said, oh, I don't like them. Them guards blow whistles outside my house. So, <laughs> And I thought that was kind of humorous. But that car was a bright, it was a dark blue. It um, advertised an auto dealership in Homestead. Uh, the lettering primarily was yellow. Um, and black outlines in some cases. So, and we are almost Murray Avenue. That just gives you another idea of what um, Squirrel Hill was like. And it generated an awful lot of ridership. Um, in the 70s, I can remember it looking like this. It was a golf court, a uh, golf station here, a gas station. I remember the Sun Drug. Uh, many times, if we had to check uh, buses, and it was lousy weather. 
uh, nice people in the sun drug would let me look out the window. And at this point, of course, the 68s would turn to the right and that track is gone. It's probably a 1960s shot, but there is one certainly turning uh, before uh, the line was abandoned. But very soon, the line uh, after that August 2nd date, the line would be abandoned. Thanks to Fred Schneider for this. Um, and then you turn around and it's coming the other way. And I've looked at this picture many times. There's an Isley's in there, sun drug, very typical. And just today, I happened to notice that woman and I keep wondering now, what is she doing? And why did the photographer take the picture? But uh, I'm sure they weren't looking at each other. Uh, coming down Murray Avenue, and it certainly doesn't look very different today. Businesses, apartments, the Manor Theater is gone. Um, a number of years ago, five, eight, it, it closed within that period of time. And of course, there's some new restaurants here as well. Um, there's a yellow car and uh, this uh, city photographer obviously wasn't really interested in the streetcar. He would have backed it up a little bit. Move farther down. We're heading down the hill uh, towards the bridge over Parkway and Saline Street. And it's pretty much the same today. Certainly, if I pronounce it right, Shear Torah congregation is still there. And all the apartments are, are there on the uh, left. And uh, this is where the park, well, over on my right is where I-376, the parkway will dump its traffic off. Forward Avenue um, is here. And you can see some cars passing each other. Look at the crowds waiting um, for people. And of course, even, it may account the fact that gas rationing was in effect and, you know, cars, there weren't that many people driving. Uh, this was from the top of the hill on the other side, roughly the same intersection before uh, or any streets. Murray Avenue, uh, you can see, is not Murray Avenue, but it is private right of way. And there was so much of that in Squirrel Hill during uh, the neighborhood's development. And we'll pass that area and we'll you know, coming across the parkway, there's that huge building um, in the back is still there. That building is uh, Murray and, for, and uh, forward. And we'll pass that and have over to the bridge. Now, the day the bridge, um, the bridge, there's the, there's the ramps coming off Beachwood Boulevard. Um, and it's two way and a number of accidents occurred here. And the parkway is coming out over this. And there is the, not the new, not the current bridge now, but certainly the new bridge that replaced this thing. Uh, that was built by the Shenley Park and Highlands, that rickety thing, um, somewhere before 1900. And it looked like this. It's a typical trolley bridge um, with the signs saying, keep off the tracks. And I wonder how many people walked across it anyway as a shortcut. No idea. Uh, but it's Beachwood Boulevard now down below Celine the uh, uh, between uh, Woodlawn and Hazelwood Avenues. Now, uh, something happened here in the early, early days before 1900 or just about 1900. There was a spring um, in this area and the crews had a habit of uh, stopping to get the drink. And the company really said nothing. I don't think it was a real agreement. Um, and the crew got off and the lights were on. And then the power dropped, there was short or something happened, whole stayed on, but it put the car in total darkness. And another car uh, came down the hill, not seeing it, you know, crashed into it. So next day, uh, President W.L. Mellon said, you're not going to stop at Welfare Springs anymore. It's done. Here's a shot of that bridge um, looking towards a squirrel hill from the what will become the greenfield side and we're a couple of shots on the bridge as well you know once again you know either it, it was probably a dupe slide and it wasn't i don't know it wasn't clear to begin with perhaps certainly no, it wasn't copied clear but it's a nice shot of the neighborhood uh that's the outbound side we're looking at birchfield and flemington we're heading outbound here and that bridge eventually deteriorated and was replaced by yet another one um we leave the bridge and today you're driving here and you're driving here on Murray Avenue. Um, and, you know, Hazelwood Avenue is here and the cemetery is here. 
and Greenfield's about here, Lilac's about here. But apparently the la the track originally cut across. Uh, why not? There was nothing there. Um, and that's the shortest way to go. And here we are at Loretta Street. And uh, the Greenfield cars turned at Loretta Street. One direction to, to go back in, the 69s ended service, heading down Murray, over Hazelwood, down um, Greenfield Avenue. And they sat on Loretta Street in the other direction. And uh, some of this looks the same. And then uh, the two blocks or so between Hazelwood uh, Avenue and uh, Loretta Street. And I was able to identify quite a few of these buildings. Um, pretty much at Hazelwood Avenue now. That might be a 69 coming up behind it, short car. Now, here's looking, here's a shot looking at Murray from Hazelwood Avenue. And if this guy's a 69, he's going to turn left to go around the block. 68s would turn right on the tracks that you see in front of you. Start heading down the hill to Homestead. Another view of that from the other side. Uh, a number of these buildings are still here. So you can find out, you can look at the picture and say, yeah, yeah, I was here. A lot of drugstores uh, seem to be along this line. What's going to happen is they're going to turn real quick on Hazelwood and then they're going to bend right uh, and get onto what we now know is Beachwood Boulevard. And some of these buildings are no longer here um, over on the right. Uh, I think it's the Speedway right now. And there, there's what happens. Private right of way on Beachwood Boulevard. Now that's after they paved it, um, 1937 or so, they paved it um, when they built the uh, Homestead High Level Bridge. And uh, I thought that was kind of a cool shot though. Now 60s car, about 60 cars at Forbes and Murray joined to run with 68 and 69. At this point, it's 68 and 60 coming down the hill. Uh, different buildings in some cases, Still very commercial. Uh, I believe that's imaging down there. And uh, now here's where they'll cut through a hill. And right beyond that is the Homestead High Level Bridge. Um, there's part of that cut. And I saw something. Um, I couldn't find pictures of it. But apparently there's the High Level Bridge. Down below it, I'm sure a number of you who live here have gone over the Homestead High Level Bridge. Below that, along the B&O right-of-way was a house. And when the B&O wanted to expand, uh, a company which is still in business, which was professional in this, hoisted that house up to the top of this hill. Um, the house, of course, was not moved um, when the bridge was built and when this road was cut through. Uh, before that, you could look from the house and see this. And there it is, turning down. Um, onto what is now Parkview Boulevard. And that road would wind its way down to the river level um, and the old bridge, the low level bridge as we call it. And you could, if you see my mouse, you'll see that steep hill, private right of way running down to this low level bridge. One time there had been a ferry there. Um, all of this, all these buildings are what's known as the ward. No number, just the ward. And uh, was 11,000 families lived here. Here's the steel mill, the Homestead Works, as it existed before, oh, about 1939. Then they cleared out this entire area and expanded this mill. So they were, they were thinking, we're going to get into something, I guess. And they really you know, worked very hard to expand that mill. And the mill went onto the other side actually, of the Homestead High Level Bridge, which doesn't show in that picture. Here we are on the bridge. They opened that bridge in 36. Um, and the 68s and the 60s would come across this bridge, joined the 55s on the other side. Oh, that's out of order, but I'm sorry. Here's the bridge again. Um, 
homestead is on the other side, far side. And look at some of that industry down there where today you can play, you can see a movie, you can buy things from stores. That's part of the waterfront um, down there. But uh, and it gives a good shot of the bridge um, as well. Still there. Still there today, 90 some years old. Uh, look at all the dust that the mill generated. And here comes a, a PCC, you know, probably roaring across that bridge and, uh, you know, just scattering that dust everywhere. Now we're looking sort of east and that's what it looked like down in the ward before the mill was expanded. You see the mill well in the background and the railroad over there is the, I believe, Pennsylvania Railroad. And it was also um, over behind the buildings on the left was the B&O. Um, and there are two yellow cars, one here, one there coming off they've come off the low level bridge uh this crossing is still there and uh the ramp was put in certainly um as an expediency to get people out of there uh and the ramp is still there and all of this today is apartments giant eagle sits in here um some other things like that it's a pretty neat shot um and there here will join 55s which are coming in from uh, Hayes, the Hayes neighborhood, and uh, some pretty cool automobiles. I don't know what they are, but I like the gas price of twenty eight nine. Now, <laughs> Kristen, there's that shot that you thought was really impressive. It's from a couple blocks up on West Street, and uh, some probably some kind of a telephoto lens, but giving giving you a whole idea of the length, uh, the vastness of the Homestead High Level Bridge. That PCC is either a 60 um, or it's a 68. Kids are getting out of school, patrol guard over on the side. Here's, here's Homestead, which was a relatively busy town up through the 60s. Uh, somebody had told me that in World War II on a Saturday night, uh, everybody walked the sidewalks on one side in one direction and on the other side in the other direction. It was so uh, congested down here during the war. Uh, and another car going around. Now, some of these buildings are still here. Some of them are not. They've all fallen on hard times today. There's the Leona. That was a movie. So we're down around Ian Street. That's uh, that's one of those uh, safety islands. And you can see the protection that concrete afforded uh, passengers, waiting passengers. Um, and I looked at that movie here um, and Elizabeth Taylor was in Ivanhoe and Robert Taylor, is it? Was in both of those movies, Ivanhoe and Knights of the Round Table. And you know, I remember going to, they must have been traveling around uh, throughout the East, at least, because I remember going to that. And my friends and I sat through both movies twice back when you were allowed to, to do that. I think that was the last day of trolley service. And they brought out M454, uh, which, of course, is, I believe, is our car. And look how busy everything is. Look at all the uh, small built business, Rubens. Is there? There was a Rubens in McKeesport as well. I think it was a furniture store. There's Woolworths and Isley's and the Sun Drug. I mean, <laughs> how how Pittsburghy can you get by seeing all that? Um, and of course, the Duquesne beer sign. And we all forget that is Route 837. Now, I don't know if my scanner did this or the slide did that, but we're we're heading down, you know, to the wall on the wall you know, was that portion of the mill where uh, the Battle of Homestead with the Pinkertons occurred. And that wall along the mill here was still there when I arrived uh, here in Pittsburgh in 1975. Now we're looking at it from Martha Street. And on that wall at the bus stop was written car stop. It was still there in 1975. Um, there's another view of that. You, we get to see some 
steel mills. You want to look at the McKeesport line, right? You want to see steel mills. In this case, it's a 65 car heading to Lincoln Place, traveling on the same route. Um, and to get a, an idea of how gritty Pittsburgh was, you wanted to look at this because you could see the smog in there. And uh, that's a 55 car, I think. But, uh, you know, you could just see that, that grit, that dirt uh, that was here. And one more shot here. That one probably you know, was going to go. Now there's an overhead bridge here. And I believe what happens is um, you have a U.S. Steel office where people can come in and do whatever business they have to. And the office people can walk across to the mill, uh, but you can't get into the mill. It's all guarded. And Dave Hamley, uh, one of our members, took this um, toward the end of all of this mill. There's still actually more mill. Now, right here is Ravine Street. The Route 59 car, it's a shuttle uh, using um, double enders, uh, came out here. And at one time, the track kind of veered over to the right and around. There literally was a ravine here. And some postcards show that. And, of course, then the county would fix that. More mill in the background. Here is a location that is still there. There is track covered. It's called Munhall Loop. And buses use it. And the police sit in it. <coughs> Munhall and Whitaker police just love to hide behind some of this. And some of it is still there. Comes a car, could be a 68 coming inbound. And we'll move up to both Rankin bridges. The bridge on the left was the one built about 1897 or 8 by the Monongahela Street Railway. And you'll notice it's low. Um, and it wasn't very wide, and there were actually buildings on both sides of that bridge. There's the new bridge. So, and with the old and new there, it's probably 1950. Um, and on the other side, uh, Rankin Car House is in the clump of industries there. Um, and part of the Rankin Mill is there. And there's, there's some of the buildings and a real 68 car. 1111 um, at the old bridge. Now, we'll get to... The new Rankin Bridge, and they built this uh, this junction up here. And today, there's still a lot of buildings behind the car, and there's a whole bunch of of uh, automobile repair shops, and they stick vehicles all over the place. And it's a dangerous, I think, place whenever you have to go that direction. There's Rankin's Mill, part a little bit of which is still there for touring, um, and uh, we are starting to head up. What is known locally as Whitaker Hill. It's a fairly steep hill that, that goes up. This is the old road, not the four lane road that exists now if you're going to Kennywood. And you'll come up to about here and the car, the track will swing over along the hillside. And we'll, we'll see some of that. I put this in and really it's this wide, but um, it's a nice vista. Look over to the left. And that is the old road for any of you who have gone to Kennywood on that four lane road. Uh, when they built it, it bankrupted two companies. The third company finished it, um, but it was a massive project. But look what it was like then. And it was, I didn't get a chance to put it in. I wanted to on the bottom, just two paved tracks. And that is it. Everything on the other side um, is Braddock. Uh, and there is the Rankin Mill in the background. But we'll start rumbling up. There's the newer Rankin Bridge, and, and it will get to East Mifflin Road, and it will rumble over to the side on private right away. And uh, that's how narrow the old road was. All the way up that hill. People said that it was as much fun to ride the streetcar to Kennywood um with it clattering and bumping and you know the guy probably really flooring it um as it was to ride the rise at kennywood you know why not stay at the same place and take another picture all that is braddock and uh, east braddock over on or north braddock rather on the other side of the monongahela river you have to wonder did anybody come flying around that sharp s turn and hit a streetcar <laughs> Don't know. Here's there's it is from the top. Yeah, 
and we are going to get to the top of the hill. I believe there's near here is the speedway now. You'll see it if you go to Kennywood. Um, Glen Street um, is up in this area. So we're very close to Kennywood now, and we're still on private right away. <clears throat> Then you turn around and there is Kennywood. There was parking down here. Um, I think there still is parking down that end. And there is a car. Ed Miller photographed the car coming out of the loading track, the inbound loading track. Uh, though there were three tracks in front of the park. You'll see the switch switch here. That's taking cars to a four track yard uh, on the other side of Route 837 which I've heard called Kennywood Boulevard and Monongahela Boulevard. And uh, I don't know who's right. I wasn't born here. <clears throat> but Charlie Dangler, uh, one of our members who unfortunately has also passed, took this after the wires were down to give you a real good idea. Here uh, was a crossover here. Um, and there was a loading track here. There were several crossovers here so as one car is loading somebody else could uh get into a spot and uh there's the four track yard over here it's all parking in here now now i was told all the cars went through here and unloaded and you went through a tunnel under the road and track to get to the park during all the off park season which i guess is about nine or nine months or so um they they just went straight through they didn't use any of that. They did this. Um, no date on this, but uh, I like that no parking sign here. <laughs> and there's another shot of two cars uh, at the uh, at the loading bay. Obviously, it's not a busy day, although July 4th should be. So it must be very early in the morning. And this is what it would look like. And of course, remember that that sign, no parking here. Well, well somebody's there um, at the loading track between the main line and the uh, the loading track. Now, it was an interesting picture. Uh, and this is in our collection. And uh, they took a series of pictures um, here in 1948 because it was Kennywood's 50th anniversary. The park had opened in 1898. and uh, I showed this picture and it was an actual slideshow back then. Um, and a lot of people were there. I think it was at the Mifflin West East West Mifflin his, historical building um, municipal building. And afterwards, as people were milling all about, you know, I was trying to get started putting it away. An older woman came up from the back and I saw her, you know, coming up and I uh, figured it was pretty hard to see back there. And she asked me if she could see this slide. Well, why not? Sure. I put it on and she looked at it and she said, that's me and my mother. You know, what are the odds that that you're going to have somebody see themselves as roughly an eight year old um, in Kennywood? So she did get a copy um, of the picture. Now, here is the here we are. Kennywood is right here and we will start crossing a very high bridge and in a part of Duquesne, and then we're gonna cross another bridge. Here's the Union Railroad um, and head down Plum Alley, uh, Hamilton, and we'll get onto uh, what is now Duquesne Boulevard. This is West Penn track beginning here. Um, I think at West Penn Railways was white, white traction uh, that started a streetcar line in McKeesport and moved up here because this was the railroad station, the Pennsylvania Railroad Station. And uh, it gave McKeesport a connection to New York and Philadelphia and other towns you just couldn't reach using its native B&O. Um, they had a lease formulated between the two lines and the cars of uh, um, Mellon's cars, Mellon Street Railway started to use this. Now I'll talk about this kind of weird track um, connection. I got a better map of it. But first, let's leave Kennywood and we'll cross the typical uh, narrow Pittsburgh Railways Bridge. It looks like that. 
Port Authority inherited a number of bridges like this, not this one. This had been replaced by the county, but they inherited a number of bridges and the state would not accept them until uh, each one was completely rebuilt. And so when you hear KDK, you know, screaming about the transit company building bridges, we all know why. Pretty spindly bridge. Union Railroad uh, was running underneath here, as you see, taking slag somewhere. There it is on the, there it is. People probably looking at the train. That's what I would do. Uh, but that's how narrow everything was. You can imagine traffic on this bridge going in both directions, automobiles. Um, the county really wanted to replace these bridges and this whole stretch of narrow road. Um, and they wanted the trolleys out. But what really forced at least these cars, the McKeesport cars out, was the city, which wanted to redo Murray Avenue. So, you know, about six miles of this trolley line was just cut out. Here, here we are entering Plum Alley from Thompson um, Thompson Run Bridge. And it still kind of goes this way, but it's a big, wide uh, curve. There's the Union Railroad. Um, but, and there's the beginning of the U.S. Steel's Duquesne Works. And we're on Plum Alley, and it truly is an alley. Uh, nothing is here. This hill isn't here anymore, by the way. Uh, I think 2nd Street or 2nd Avenue uh, runs through here today. Look how narrow that road is not a problem with even small early automobiles but it would get to be a big problem um, also take a good look at the wall not too far is it from the track and there were crossovers with single track um, on the curve at the other end and it was a crossover here and you get a good look at that wall now uh, when I was working at the Port Authority with uh, Arthur Ellis Sr., he told me about this. He said that when it rained, bigger rain that we've had, the wall pushed in just enough to keep the uh, yellow cars and PCCs from getting by. And at that point, uh, Duquesne didn't like this, from my understanding. You had to run the cars in both directions using the crossover. Here's the other end and another view of the wall. And they will go back into single track. And they want to do that so they can make this tight turn onto Hamilton. All these buildings are gone. It's a shopping center, somewhat failed shopping center, like so many shopping centers. Um, Duquesne really wanted to redevelop this area. You can take a look at some of the uh, old um, kind of uh, you know icky buildings that were here, 100-year-old buildings. That's part of the Duquesne works there. Um, and Duquesne, Duquesne Avenue was a very small, narrow street. Here's car 1000, obviously on a fan trip, but a really nice shot of Mill in the background. And everybody took pictures of this. And I don't know what happened to the automobile traffic that was here. I'm sure they were not happy, but just look at those buildings. It was just, you know, part of a kind of a icky, icky down, down heeled town. I don't know why the ink spots are on the slide. They were there. And this is what Duquesne Avenue looked like. This is from about Grant Street. There's a crossing now in an industrial park on my right. And back here is PCC, probably getting ready to do that S turn here. I never noticed that before, but you know, you get an idea of just how old everything was and you know how down on its luck it was. Uh, and looking south again from Grant Avenue, um, there's one of those footbridges leading from a U.S. Steel office across the tracks, across the road, um, into the mill. So Duquesne wanted to develop all of this, or redevelop all of this. And meanwhile, the track was on the side, um, one side of the road. And you can see there's a shoe fly here. Um, I think towards, but not quite the end of service, 57, um, there was a wall, the Pennsylvania Railroad is right on the other side and a retaining wall holding the street up and tracks fell in, blocked a railroad track. And it took about six months to repair. Um, and at first there were buses running as far, or trolleys running as far as Kennywood, buses running beyond that. Duquesne really wanted these streetcars out of here. And the railways is like, you know, we really don't have the buses right now. You know, it's like not in our plan. 
and you know needing to get the money uh, through normal ways of working not getting a subsidy um the trolleys went back on a single track they were allowed to use a single track in both directions there was a it was a fairly wide street here um they wouldn't have had any kind of problem there's another shot of the mill it's from the internet so it's kind of a uh, you know a jpeg everybody puts two mega two megabyte jpegs or two kilobyte jpegs then you don't get the great shot here's the here's the view of the concrete over overpass that was typical and oh, they they actually made steel here they actually also fabricated uh steel parts uh here as well and there we are the Penzi hopper cars probably coming up out of Charleroi and uh we're we'll calling it a coal mines down there and some buildings were here see how close it was to the wall so when that wall fell in it did affect at least one track <clears throat> more steel works here's the fabricating end of it the uh, red white and blue state of main car some of you might remember those ran in freight trains um, there's ore cars there's little tiny ore cars um, part of the furnaces here and we're on that year's the crossover to get you you can see that they're crossovers um, part of that track is blocked until the wall can be repaired <clears throat> it's key sport now in the back background uh, the lower end of the mill or the lower end the southern end of duquesne and southern end of the mill and i can remember this was all here until about 80 82 um uh, never went down and took pictures i was silly well you went across then what i have heard called the mckeesport duquesne bridge i've heard some people call it the bowman street bridge because bowman street is out over here somewhere but in any case the original low bridge uh which came across crossed pennsylvania railroad and uh here it is no that's the railroad they crossed the penzi uh, there were B&O tracks up here. Union trains came down. There was roughly 10 tracks in this area. And the crossing that was originally here, as you might expect, was called a death zone. Um, dangerous, a very dangerous crossing. And uh, what happened was the Pittsburgh Railways built, and I think I have a better one. Yeah, I do. Pittsburgh Railways came off this bridge and built their own track up and over over the railroads and into Jerome Alley. Now, where's Jerome Alley? Well, if you go down there, you won't find it anymore. Part of it is Lyle Boulevard, very wide Lyle Boulevard. But it used to look like that all the way down. And this was West Penn track the Pittsburgh Railways operated on. Um, all of this was torn out. They went all the way down, I believe, to uh, Locust Street and then up to Fifth Avenue and um, over Fifth and then over and up Sinclair to terminate. And this was West Penn Track, as I said. Um, this was a county photo in 1933, and they had already been planning to rebuild everything. Um, Pittsburgh Railways would run the local service <clears throat> on this section between Duquesne and McKeesport. That was under the lease agreement. And uh, they used these little small uh, small four-wheel cars. And seeing Jerome Alley, you can only imagine why. Um, when they finally built this, uh, the county built this and opened it up, I believe, in 27 or 8. Um, the cars were much elevated over the railroad, and uh, going down, there was a new Lyle Boulevard being built. They would head down a ramp and then go into right straight down Fifth Avenue uh, into the business section of it. There's the ramp. Uh, so the new bridge is back up in here and we're going to come down. And over to my right are the cars, the 56 and 98 cars um, on Fifth Avenue coming from Pearl Street Loop. <clears throat> And if I turn around, not much here today. Um, but the cannon, I believe, is still there. And they had track here. It's now paved over, but it's still there. 
Uh, you get an idea of what some of these buildings were like. Um, this is Lyle Boulevard. And uh, that was all torn out. Jerome Alley, all this was torn out. Here's Fifth Avenue. The hospital is right around the corner. All this grass is a very steep hill and the McKeesport Cemetery is there. And, uh, you know, somebody else with a great camera uh, taking a picture probably while it was bouncing around. But this is the lower end of McKeesport. And none, hardly any of this exists. Oh, so many of these old buildings have been torn down. This is... Um, this is beyond the hospital or south of the hospital. And, you know, we're uh, Goodman's is down here. We're, we're heading towards the railroad crossing, the infamous uh, railroad crossing. And I try to remember, I thought I, you know, I remember real good, but I, I remember somebody told me what Goodman's was. And I don't know that I can remember it right now, but um, any case, and, you know, as more and more cars came, into play and it became wider um and you can see this guy is pretty much up against the parked car and if you look at everybody on the right you're seeing they're all trying to pass down here on two different ways and the trolleys on on uh and i use this to demonstrate it 68s got involved in this and it was just a big mess and the keysport couldn't wait to get rid of all the streetcars which finally would happen in 1963. But this old section, um, I'm using it um, because this has rarely been photographed. The Minerva Bakery is over on my right. I believe that's still there. Some and comments in the chat, George. It's it's uh, the jewelry store. Go oh, ahead. thank you. I'm writing that down. I, I'm going to write that down. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Um, now, we'll, we'll get a... Notice how they... They tried to tell people how to park. Some people, I think, were on the curb, if you can do that. And uh, But they did block streetcars. Now, I think there were five movies in McKeesport. You can see three of them. Um, the Liberty, the Victor was, was here. And uh, well, all in this area. See, there's one right there. Another one with the awning here. So can you imagine five movie theaters in this small area? Now, I... This is not a shot from a drone, really isn't. Um, but it's a nice shot, probably Ariel McKeesport, showing you Fifth Avenue and how busy it was, how many buildings uh, they were there. You know, Hershberger's um, was there, and that was. Um, hmm. I got that written down here. I know. I know Greenblatt's was furniture. No, oh, Hershberger's was a uh, department store, and there were eight department stores here. Um, I think. JC, I think Murphy's, yeah, JC Murphy had their headquarters here. Um, they're down there. Although their their premier store, their actual first store is uh, behind me on the other side of the room or, or right down in here somewhere. Um, that was their original store. Rubens was also a department store, I believe. It's a busy place. Now, Ed Miller took this and uh, the tracks are used by 98s, by uh, 56 and by 68, but the 68s are now going to make its turn and end. There's Isley's uh, National Bank, you know, the Patotsky's was another jewelry store here. Look how busy it is down in McKeesport. And we're gonna turn up onto Sinclair and run up one block to Sixth Avenue. And there's Roma's and Roma's just like, it was just, it was a vegetable and fruit store. And it was just like shopping in Philadelphia's Italian market. And this place was always busy. Um, and they always had merchandise produce uh, sitting outside on the corner. And there was a bus depot right off to the left and the streetcars and uh, city, you know, buses, some West Penn buses, other buses um, would all end here. And then you would turn, we're at the intersection with Locust Street. Here's another shot of it, though. Uh, church, I think that's an old St. Nicholas Church. There's a new one somewhere else it's an orthodox church and yeah because i think my chiropractor goes to a saint nicholas but they've moved they've built a new one uh somewhere else council hated the tracks here it usually was very crowded uh, they wanted the trolleys to go and go straight go across these tracks you know get blocked blocked in by any train that came around and, and turned somewhere 10th ward anywhere they didn't care um and pittsburgh railway stood firm 
and they always turned here. And uh, I happened to get this from the McKeesport Model Railroad Club. I don't have it, but I saw something. It was way up on top of the wall. I said, can I scan it? And I came back with my scanner and I scanned it. And I scanned it, you know, kind of crazily at 1500 DPI, which I know all of you were saying, what? But this is what you can do. You can take a piece of it out. Somebody asked me, what car is that? Well, it's 1138, guys which I know is starting to get back into shape again. And uh, then then we turn and we head back and down to block Sinclair and uh, we're heading back. Now, what we'll do, and then of course, here was the bus substitution sign. I decided to put that in. Um, and the end of the 68, um, this was, uh, so this was, it was September 20th, 58. This is the day after fan trip at Kennywood. And there's a 60 bus sitting here. There's the fan trip in the four track yard. And was that really the abandonment? Because I was told this story um, by a transit member and I can have, I got to read it. It's hard to remember this, but I can remember a, a member, Jim Cresty, and some of you older people might remember him. He was a museum member and said he, he was in Squirrel Hill and he got on a bus um, and uh, the bus substitute for the streetcar and nothing really happened until they get to Craig Street and the old bus begins to start dying and the transmission is slipping. And he's rolling down Forbes Avenue and finally pulls into Craft Avenue Carhouse. Why not? The bus isn't working. He's right there. And a trolley had just come in, just pulled into the yard. Uh, so the supervisor, you know, got everybody off the bus, you know, probably told the operator, you, could you want some overtime? Uh, oh, sure. Why not? And they took the car out and, you know, away he goes downtown, signed up as Route 68. And he runs through town, dropping off and picking up very, very surprised passengers who know that there's no 68 trolley. Um, but when he got back to Kraft, they had found another bus and, and everything became normal again. But that may indeed have been the last, at least unofficial, Route 68 uh, trolley. Now, we'll talk a little bit about Glassport. Because I want to stay in McKeesport um, before we leave next uh, two weeks uh, on Route 56. And this is a really complicated. 98, 99, they kept switching destinations all the time. And around the turn of the century, the 98 was running from Glassport all the way up Fifth Avenue and all the way up to East McKeesport, down the hill in the Wilmerding. And this is the only picture we have at it. And it was used... Um, it was a postcard shot from Nathan Zappler uh, used in one of our calendars. Now, here's the 99, okay? Um, they're up, this is up on Evans Avenue, okay? The 98 was cut back in the 30s, and eventually the 98 uh, was, you know, extended, 99 was extended from McKeesport to Glassport. At one time, the 98 was cut back from the Glassport to the 10th Ward. So there's always a lot of confusion, but but there's a lot of, there's always streetcar service being provided. Here's an old friend, uh, 4398 is up here. Um, and and they wanted to get rid, of course, in the 50s of these yellow cars, they don't want them. So this is the double-ended line up here on Evans Avenue. Um, when the Mansfield Bridge opens, Okay, no trolleys are going to run through the 10th Ward. The 56 has moved onto the Mansfield Bridge. Um, and so what they do, I think it was in 52, they replace the yellow cars to Glassport with PCCs. And they're going to run back and forth to Pearl Street. This shuttle is running from Evans Avenue down into the 10th Ward to provide service. Because outside of one tiny dangerous crossing, there's really no good way for an automobile to get in the 10th Ward. They'll eventually build ramps. I think they're called ramp one, and ramp two. Um, and they will be able to get rid of these old cars in 1953. Um, it's a rather crappy slide, but there's the mill in the background. We're past, we're on Evans Avenue Hill. We're rolling up the hill past the hospital, the old part of the McKeesport hospital. Um, it's the emergency room now in that area. And there's, there's the old hospital, some of the new hospital. That old hospital has been replaced uh, with a newer version, uh, probably now 40 years old there. 
but here's that car coming out onto Route 68, PCC 98, and Route 56. So plenty of service on Fifth Avenue. All these buildings that you see, except for that one hospital building, are gone. And this whole area around the hospital is just full of these old buildings, small stores, um, cleaners. Um, apparently, the high school, somebody told me, was located on the top of the hill. And there was a set of stairs from here off to the right on the top of the hill. Uh, here it is in downtown Green Walls, which I think was a drugstore. And uh, you see how narrow everything is, though. You just see all the people waiting to get on a streetcar. Uh, when the Port Authority like that today. Now, when you crossed, it's not quite the three bridges, but over here is the bridge, the Fifth Avenue Bridge over the Yakagani. The county put that in in the mid 30s. Here's how Pittsburgh Railways Route 56 cars entered the 10th Ward. It crossed over the PLE and it wandered through a few streets, got on Atlantic Avenue, and then over the old Dravosburg Street Bridge. And we'll see that the earliest streetcars in McKeesport, little four-wheelers, ran on this. The suspension bridge, I believe, is 3rd third, third Avenue. And uh, But here's the 99s coming off Evans Avenue. And, you know, they are going to go down into the 10th Ward. And they'll end service very close to the old Dravosburg Bridge. And I just found this today. And for those of you that remember me doing a program on women in transit, Boy, I wish I had found this because there is a Pittsburgh Railways motor woman uh, in color, complete with her uniform and her little cap, um, helping somebody off the car, making sure, like we're supposed to do as conductors um, at the museum, making sure that that person uh, gets off safely. Now, if you're a 98, you're starting at Pearl Street Loop. Um, this now is underneath a whole bunch of highway um highway uh there's there's an interchange there um you can go every which way but uh pearl street had both 98s when the pccs arrived and the 56s and there was some parking there um and it was just kind of a uh -huh, no, neighborhood old unpainted houses you know everything you'd want to see in a steel mill town that's been there for 100 years um and, and including that uh the smoke uh, now we have NIMBYs and, you know, they were afraid to live a hundred miles from this back then. This meant people were working. Uh, the economy was good, you know, and we're very happy, you know, let's just keep all this red dust up from the steel mill. Uh, and that's at Pearl street loop. And then we'll leave the loop. There's that cemetery, uh, including people that are buried on this hillside. Um, you can see them on the hill. So you hope it don't collapse. And I'm standing here where Lyle Boulevard and Fifth Avenue will divide. Um, and there's the cannon. So I walked back a few feet and that's a World War II Memorial. Um, but there's that red dot. I saw this, I said, yep, put the dust in. Uh, because that's what everybody lived with and accepted. Now, I don't know, you know, you get grungy slides like this, maybe early ectochrome. Uh, but it's a section of McKeesport that literally doesn't exist. This may be the stairs that we talked about earlier heading up to the top of the hill. And you can see the lines again and, you know, I did your car in there. And it was really a tight fit through there. Um, you wonder about, I always wonder about this, you know, he's on that side of the line, but you just wonder. Um, but it was kind of a, you know, an interesting area downtown. Here's the... Uh, Liberty Theater, I think, is back there. The Victor is back here, near Liberty Victor. And this was another movie theater, and it had uh, this tile. Capitol has an awning. Now, this overhead view shows you a problem. All the streetcars in McKees Ford faced. And in fact, everybody did. And the B&O kits sliced right through all 13 main streets, sliced in. Uh, Mm. Yeah, excuse me. And so that also blocked the streetcars, which I believe are down around here. And so when a train goes, there's no alternative. You have to sit and you have to wait. Here's Sinclair Street. Here's Isley's was there. Petoskey's a jewelry store. We're very close to the crossing, which is right here. 
Now it was served by freight trains and passenger trains. Here's Balsamo's. Balsamo's uh, was a very popular food market and uh, it had a section where the produce was. Apparently there was a dirt and sawdust floor in there. Um, outside there was, uh, I'm reading this, shiny cobalt blue tile front. And there was always a policeman at the crossing, the track in front. Well, that's where the 68s pulled out of, out of uh, Locust Street. There's Babe Sheranahan, or Frank Babe Sheranahan, who was almost a constant fixture um, at that crossing. It was so busy with pedestrians. Not in this picture, of course, but there's a 98 car. And, uh, you know, that's when the yellow cars uh, were still running. And that's probably on a Sunday. Uh, Samuel's was a shoe store. Uh, Rubens, I believe, was the department store. There was a thrift. I think right next to the thrift over to the right was the um, the, the, the bookstop, bookshop. And the star, would you believe it? This was a restaurant here that you actually got dressed up to go in. It's a bar and a restaurant. And uh, Kristen, you had asked at some point about the... Uh, uh, netting that protected the uh, trolley pole from totally whipping off a wire. And there it is. And there was a tower off to my right. And there was a person there who pumped these gates down. And trains were a problem here because think about it. Freight trains came on that curve very slowly. And there were a heck of a lot of them. Trains were not 300 uh, car beasts. They were probably 70 or 80 cars. The passenger cars First, and I was told this by somebody who lived there, first, the baggage cars had to stop at the station. They did all their thing. And the train is still blocking Fifth Avenue. Then they moved up and anybody that was in Pullman's getting off there did their thing. Then the coaches were have, having to unload. And even though I'm sure people were ticketed to go to certain cars, you made three stops all the while blocking this. Um, and if you were smart like this 99, uh, you were getting out of there before the uh, train, the southbound b and steam powered train got through. And there's Duquesne Pilsner. I don't know what Bill Barron is, but that's where the thrift drug was uh, much later. <clears throat> now, here's a shot of the uh, b &O station with the souvenir shop. Um, you can see cars and freight, freight sightings here. Um, everybody, of course wanted to shoot at this crossing at many different angles. Here's the station in color without the souvenir shop, without that, that thing that obscured rather beautiful um, little building. And there's Murphy's uh, headquarters up here. Now I had a friend in college who lived there and I was told this story many years ago, but uh, their church was on the other side of the tracks from their home. And, uh, you know, you family's out, you want to get to church on time. And none of the three kids in that car really wanted to get to church on time. Um, they always hoped there would a train, and many times a train did come. And, uh, you know, I mean, their dad had been in the army, so he was saying wonderful words. And in the meantime, they were um, guessing real quick, throw out a number, how many cars, and then they would count the cars. And they would many times get to church late. Here's a caboose. Um, he's going, I guess, north. And it was a serious crossing as well, because you can imagine, you saw the hospital. It's on one side. What if the ambulance is picking me up and I have to wait for a slow moving train? And I have been told there were problems when people died in the hospital in the ambulance, uh, fires that could not be reached by the fire company, um, you know, got out of control. So it was a bad a bad thing. And then, of course, Pittsburgh Railways was responsible for this crossing and they would tie it up as well. So whenever their tracks or the railroad's tracks were bad, um, this crew would would block the street and you'd have to go around around a bunch of blocks. So, you know, that that crossing, you know, was pretty bad. Now, about 1970, they actually forced the railroad to deal with p and uh, which had a way around it, cro it crossed the Yawk and, you know, went down the Yawk on the other side for a while, paralleling the B&O. Um, and they worked out an arrangement so the B&O could operate over the P&LE and then cross over uh, farther down near Versailles to their own tracks. And I believe this was the first railroad to actually get out of downtown. 
Uh, you can see this kind of tie up would not be there. That crossing still had a police officer uh, or this area still had a police officer for a while after that. It was just so busy down there. There's the Rexall. We've seen that. Here's the Murphy uh, Murphy's Five and Dime store. That was their first store that was successful. And it was in uh, McKeesport. And it was on the different on the other side of the track from their headquarters building. Uh, but there's Hirschberg's again. Um, I think Kaplan was at a shoe store. I'm trying to remember. Um, I think it was a music store. That's what it was. The star is right over to the photographer's right. Um, and there's most of the most of the businesses, the big buildings, the department stores. We're down here in this section in between the river, which is back here, and roughly the crossing. Okay. Um, there's the Memorial Theater was down here at Market Street. So cars could come in, and if they needed to, they could turn back to Glassport or back on the 56 if there was a problem, say, at the crossing. But they could do that. There was a Carlton, which I believe was a hotel. <clears throat> greens again uh, it was pretty it was it this was a very busy area western pennsylvania national bank which i believe is now uh, metamorphosed into pnc there's an ad car the chrysler ad car his memorial at market street this is the famous this huge building this is another department store burned down <clears throat> we're at market street look at how everybody's dressed everybody goes out you know no tattoos no ripped jeans you know no t-shirts uh everybody was dressed to the nines to come downtown you didn't dare you know go down anywhere and uh, without looking good that drugstore on the corner, I think, was Riggs, I believe. Uh, yeah, Riggs, as he turns. He's an inbound 56, masquerading as an inbound Route 98 car, because he's here. Um, but two good shots of uh, the business section down here. I don't have one of Cox's store. Apparently, Cox was another department store. It was still there in 1975. And back in the 60s, there was a walkway, a runway sort of on the second floor of the building. And they would host fashion shows uh, on that building. Models would walk uh, back and forth. A fire truck. Now, this guy is turned down Market Street. He's turning inbound on Lyle Boulevard, the only part of Lyle Boulevard to have tracks. There, there's the famous right there. Except this guy is an, is a car heading into McKeesport and turning around. Um, I don't know why, but that's why they had this little loop, the ability to turn around. And can you imagine a fire in the famous? Can you imagine the size of that fire? Now, if you go the other way, then along Lyle Boulevard in one track, coming around here on track there okay we're going to cross the yacht on a county built bridge mid-30s built bridge the 10th ward cars come down in here and the tracks kind of separate in here to atlantic avenue and off my picture is the old Ravosburg bridge bridge the glassport cars however are going to continue down west fifth avenue <clears throat> and they will go past the mansfield bridge but Let's go across the bridge over the yacht first. There's the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, which is now hosting its own trains and the Baltimore and Ohio railroad trains. And we're on the yacht bridge. Look at, but look at all that. I mean, it's hard to look at those buildings, the mill stacks, these high buildings, um, and realize that hardly any of that is there now. A lot of that's been torn down. There's the National Bank. Ed Miller took this, uh, he walked up a little hill. Remind Street is there. And but I mean, that was a real bustling town um, in those days. And nowadays, you, know, you can see the switch is left in. Here's how the 56s and any other car, you know, wandered over into the 10th Ward. Here's the PLE. Um, here could be could be a glassboard car. 
or a 56 heading in on the bridge over the Yakagani River. Okay. And there's where the ramp, the ramp has been put in, I think ramp two has been replaced the uh, trolley bridge. Um, it hasn't changed too much. That big high wall is here, but down in the 10th ward, there's an awful lot of churches. I mean, they're not there, not there anymore. Skyline Drive, I think, is up, up here. And there's the elbow room, which I do think is still there. I do believe elbow room is still there. And there's one of those marvelous concrete things. And you know, I remember going into uh, a newspapers at the his. Uh, the Heritage Society, the McKeesport Heritage Society. And I was looking for information on the 56 and I found a piece um, that, that said that, okay, we got the, we've got these safety islands up here and we've got the trolleys up here. And now that the road has been rebuilt, they're having nothing but accidents and automobiles are crashing into these safety islands because they're not adhering to the 25 mile an hour speed limit. And surprisingly, they're drinking. Look the other way. There's back in yellow car days and the glassport car heading down. There's the southbound or north. Yeah, it's probably a northbound PLE. Half of those homes are gone now. They're not here. And then you'll get to the Mansfield Bridge. We'll cover that in more depth um, two weeks from now. Um, the 56s are out or inbound are coming up this ramp to the bridge. The glassport cars are going to slide under the bridge and that track was there for years and it's there but it's paved over now and if they came back up they did come up on a ramp to to connect <clears throat> with the outbound route 56 this big industrial complex uh probably not as busy but it's still there it's u.s deals Irvin works and it's a very quick ride to glassport and the whole the whole ride i think is about two miles uh, but the and you entered Glassport via residential suburb, um, and they got on the Monongahela Avenue. Then they would turn up a block on Ninth and end on Ohio Avenue, very close to the, uh, but not at uh, the Clarendon Bridge. This is, I think, Third Street, um, and it was brick paving all the way down. Anybody remember brass parking meters over on the left? Um, they did have a small business area. And and many, many of these towns, you'll notice they have little uh, hotels, Fifth Avenue Hotel. And McKeesport had a number of these smaller hotels, which were supposed to be pretty good and just for people, you know, staying over for a day or two uh, conducting business. But here's their two or three block downtown. And if you look the other way, Dave Hamley, our member, took this. That's the same hotel over on the left. And look, you can drop off your mail and you can get gas all in the same place. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't the biggest uh, downtown. A lot of people obviously went to McKeesport. Short trolley ride, a lot of buildings, eight department stores, movies. Well, where else would you go? But you could get your basic necessities here. Uh, probably this bowling alley was probably in the basement of this building. Um, maybe they had some teenagers setting the pins. I don't know, but you could do that. They had five and 10. There's ninth. And we've gone through downtown Glassport. Uh, just this little S turn on ninth. The stadium is right over uh, to my left. And this set of steps led to a swimming pool, which I think is, is up on this hill up here. We're passing the stadium. Roller skating. In roller skate. I like that gas price, 27.9. There's the Glassport Stadium. And of course, there was glass making in Glassport. Um, I've never seen it, uh, but there was. We're very close now to the end of the line, and uh, gas has gone up. It's 31, but we're still at the stadium and cars are passing. And if you look at, uh, if you look at slides you'll sometimes see they assign the same three or four cars um every, almost every day to glassport um now in yellow car days they would there was crossover here and they would just cross over that's a pennsylvania railroad facility back here uh there may have been a roundhouse i think back there but then the cars would 
uh, have to have a loop and they put this little loop here. Uh, you could still see the location. I don't know if anybody has built on it. Um, but what happens in the end, it's kind of wild. Um, I know I know that the, the Pittsburgh Railways have been approached by the state about the Glenwood Bridge and railways basically said, you know what, just buy us the buses. And they weren't fighting, you know, um, and I don't know, maybe they weren't making as much money as they wanted to, or maybe they figured they could save. Um, and Glassport would have gone obviously at the same time because these cars all came out of Glenwood Car House and Glenwood was on the other side of the Glenwood Bridge. So September 1 uh, was the day that they they said it would go, but there was early August, the second or third, there was a huge windstorm. Uh, I don't know if it would have been a tornado, but it was bad enough to demolish parts of the town, tear up all the overhead and actually knock down trolley poles. And so here's the railways thinking, oh, we're gonna get rid of this thing in a, you know, in a month, what do we do? Well, they ran buses the next day and they were probably making a deal at that point that one of the many private operators, this is not a Noble J. Dick bus, uh, but it does represent it. And Noble J. Dick, Dick took over um, the Glassport trolley service and Pittsburgh Railways abandoned the 56 on schedule on September 1st. And with that, we're going to have to wait for two weeks to ride into um, downtown from the Keysport and see the fast way. And that was the fast way. So I'm really open to comments. Um, if I can answer questions, I'd love to. And uh, so Kristen, you can, you can go ahead and, and set that up. Okay, before uh, we do that, uh, I want to thank you, George, for presenting. And uh, I didn't even have time to put your May 16th show on here, but that will be Tuesday, May 16th. Uh, oh, we also have May uh, 7th Free Museum Day coming up this Sunday. It's going to be very busy, over 500 people expected at the museum. And anything on wheels, June 3rd and 4th. Um, let's see. And I want to thank everybody for coming today. Thank you so much for George. Uh, George, your presentation, <laughs> if I can speak here. <laughs> I'm reading. Long it. day, isn't it? <laughs> Long day. But uh, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation at patrolley.org slash support. And thank you again to those of you who donated during the registration process. We really, really appreciate that. Um, and now I am going to allow everyone to unmute themselves here. Let's see, getting tons of good comments here. There were actually some really interesting comments, George, if you want to scroll up in the chat. Oh, um, yeah, hey, I'm still looking at your help us stay on track slide. Oh, Is yeah, you can still scroll see? through the chat here, though. So let's see, uh, okay. participants to unmute themselves. The okay, here. and feel free to turn your videos on now as well. Um, we had um, Robert Swartz making some really interesting comments. Uh, he said his family's standard auto company, Ford, later Chrysler, Plymouth, and McKeesport had the towing contracts with <laughs> both the city and Pittsburgh railways. They moved a lot of cars blocking the car lines and pulled a lot of wreck <laughs> safety island bullnoses, especially the ones on West Fifth Avenue. <laughs> hey, Kristen, can you send me uh, copies of that, of the chat? Yeah, sure. sure. And then, I, then I'll have it to copy over. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I'd love to put some of this stuff, uh, put it in the show. Yeah, some, some of the comments are really funny. And then uh, he also said that, uh, let's see, I think it was on one of the Pearl Street uh, slides that he saw his grandfather's wholesale candy store on the right oh. side of one of the photos. It's oh, wow. gone now, but the Henry Lamp sign on top from his uncle, from uh, Henry D. Nils, let's see, uncle who built it in 1900 is at the McKeesport Heritage Center now. So, oh, wow. Lots wow. of memories uh, evoked by your presentation. Um, and I think he also noted that the school on top of the hill where we saw that school sign was uh, Fifth Avenue Elementary, not not the high school. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, lots of other comments coming in. If you would like to unmute yourself um, and ask a question, feel free to do so. Um, a couple folks mentioning that it was actually an EF3 tornado that came through glass. Oh, it was a tornado then. Okay. All yeah. right. EF3. You can't right. always trust the newspapers. They just said it was high winds. I will change that EF3 tornado. 
Yeah, and then let me uh, end the share here so we can all see each other. If you're having any issues turning your video on, just let me know. Uh, I did. If I turned your video off at the beginning of the show, it may tell you that I have disabled your your video. So just let me know uh, if you'd like to turn your video on. Let's see. Oh, I'm just looking at the chat. I didn't realize the famous fire took four blocks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Holy crow. <clears throat> now, the question is, was that uh, an accidental fire or arson? It was accidental. <laughs> uh, okay. Yep. Any questions for George? Or anyone else have uh, memories that got sparked during this presentation? <laughs> George, I I just want, George, I just wanted to say thank you. You took me back to my childhood. You're very and, welcome. And all, uh, all those great shots. Um, I actually am sending you a note in the chat. I'd love if you... I'll, I'll send you my email. I'd just like to connect with you separately. Good. Uh, yeah, I guess. Christine, I don't know. How do you yeah, say I can, I can help connect you guys uh, you after that? the program. So actually, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, all you have to do is hit uh, reply on the confirmation email that you got for tonight. Uh, um, perfect. My email is assistant at patrolley.org. I'll put that in the chat if I can remember. I have a question for George. Well, I see Bill. What's Bill? Hi, uh, wasn't Forbes Avenue known as Forbes Street back then when most of those pictures were taken? Okay, well, I should have put my hearing aids on. You're, you were breaking up a bit. Um, wasn't Forbes Avenue known as Forbes Street back then, I think? was. Oh, the well, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. It was Diamond Street before it was Forbes Avenue, though, I thought. Originally, it was Diamond Street. You go downtown on, on Diamond Street, and that was the street. I know that. I'd have to research whether it was Forbes Street, um, unless any of you locals can uh, chime in on that. It was Forbes Avenue when I went to school at Carnegie Tech in the very early 60s. Yeah. Also, great pictures from uh, all the way from downtown, all the way out Forbes Avenue to... Uh, Pass Murray. I used to ride that line. <laughs> a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It took a lot of years of finding these things. And yeah, I've, I've gotten some when, off the when, internet, but there are some that you have that I've never seen. Well, when I when I got to Pittsburgh, 1975, to join the Port Authority, you know, and they sent me all over on buses early on so that I mm -hmm. could uh, become acclimated to the neighborhood. And every time I went down into Homestead in Munhall, I mean, it was just nothing but steel all the way down the river. And it was fascinating. And I think that's where I picked up the interest for uh, for this. Um, and then people, bus drivers would tell me about the 56. And there's Ray Janosko. And, you know, he lived right off the 56. Um, and he would tell me about how it was on Mifflin Road. And you know, for a while, I couldn't figure out how do you get a road in a trolley? And then I realized it was probably looking like Jerome Alley out there, but mm. you know, two tracks and a tiny. <laughs> so that's how I got interested in that. And uh, it's getting harder and harder to find Pittsburgh material, but, mm. uh, there but I, I am glad to do this one. I was really looking forward to doing this. Yeah. And, uh, just so everyone's there, we sprung uh the two-parter news on George. Uh, we had our practice session earlier today and George had like 300 plus slides. And I thought, you know, that could be a part two presentation. So uh, hopefully we'll see all of you guys back <laughs> again. I was actually thinking about that because, uh, and I'm happy I did that because I didn't have to rush. I hope that my my pace was okay. And yeah, I didn't good have comment. to rush. Um, so um, one of the comments from Ray Steffens, he says, uh, I lived on Adams Avenue in West Mifflin on the 56, and we had two downtowns, Pittsburgh or McKee. Yeah, and when someone the Morton, say, that was the Morton plan, I believe. Yeah, uh, when someone <laughs> would say they were going downtown, we'd have to ask which yeah, one. Which one? <laughs> uh, that's good. He says, yes. But, but, but seeing the pictures, you can understand why he said that. Because Keysport had probably almost everything you needed at one time. Yeah. I used to live near there too, and I used to get take the fifty, uh, the sixty-five to Lincoln Place, and then we would go 
uh, inbound to uh, Pittsburgh or outbound to the Peace Port. Yeah, yeah. That was a fun ride through the, uh, through the woods. To the it was a lot of right away on that line, yes. And, and I believe it was known as the fast line to and from. Once you got off Second Avenue, it, it really had a lot of private right away. Yeah. All right, other uh, comments, yeah. memories for George? Hey, George, you yeah, right. uh, when you were showing Glassport, you actually showed 1630 running on the Glassport line. Of course, I that saw was that. One of the, um, that was one of the experimental PCCs that led to the 1700s. I always had heard that car was based at Glenwood. So it was, was that probably, a yeah? Was it a fan trip or was <clears> that actual <throat> running? Because if that's the know. case, you proved that Glenwood had that car. I don't know if it doesn't say. You know, when when I it when people take fan trips, most of them do not write where they are, when they are, what it is, uh, because they know, right? And and as Ed Leibarger says, they'll stay alive forever. Um, so it's hard to know, but you know, all these routes came out of Glenwood. I believe the 98, 99 came out of Glenwood. And uh, cause there's a shot of 4398 that Ed Miller took in Glenwood car house. And certainly the 55, 56, 57, 58 came out of Glenwood. So. How about the 65? Uh, good question. Uh, I don't know if it originally came out of Glenwood. In the end, it was coming out of another car. I think it, in the end, it came out of Craft Avenue. The only way to get there in the end, I know, was to come out of Craft Avenue and run through East Pittsburgh and, and back through Braddock. And you know, it was a long, convoluted right route. But, um, you know, the archives, most of you guys know, or all of you guys know, the archives got moved. And uh, so it's a little bit more difficult right now trying to find things. Um, but we do have route cards that were fastidiously handwritten till about the mid thirties uh, when I guess the depression made it unnecessary to do that. If we can find the route cards, if I can identify where that file cabinet is, I can take a look at the early uh, years and it might say, you know, now don't forget there's two 65s, right? I mean, uh, when the 65 was a PCC, it went to Munhall. Uh, I thought originally it 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 was the Ravine Street car that went back up up the hill, <laughs> but they needed a place to turn the PCC when they installed it, mm -hmm. so they put it in Muldowney, and then they had Munhall Loop already there, and then that became the fifty nine, that I think only went to downtown, downtown Homestead. Let's get wife, it, downtown's right. My, my wife used to ride that in Homebush. Homeville was, yeah, the end of the line was like behind the Homeville Fire Hall um, off of Green Springs Avenue, and it ended at Water Street. So like the West Penn, they did not go onto the street. They walked to the car. And if you still want to walk down it right away and get tick tick bites, you could you could certainly walk it um, until you get to the fire hall. I'm sorry, what? Your 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 signal breaks up. Uh, and I don't know why, but uh, I was just saying she lived right across the street from me. Oh, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, All right. A couple of couple of last thoughts. Um the curved tracks leading from Forbes to Murray was still there when I was um when I went to school at Carnegie Tech. Of course the switches were gone, but the little piece of curved track was still there. Well, the oh, Murray itself had been repaved, and also I went. We went to uh, Kennywood once, and the uh, and some of the tracks were still there. Oh, Kennywood. really? <laughs> yeah, very early sixty one, sixty two. Wow, no later than that. Though I remember seeing some tracks there. What? Right alongside the park? The, the yeah, the yeah, right the alongside the park. park. Uh huh. The highway department yeah. probably didn't need it for their road. What was that, Dave? George, the uh, picture in Glassport with the mailbox and the gas pump yeah. in front of a Hudson dealership. Okay, do you know the cross street there? Monongahela and what? Um, I was I fixed in Monongahela. 
fifth. Okay, I have to take a ride down through there and see what's left of uh, of the buildings. I know you live out there. I'll take you around. <laughs> okay. Pack a lunch and away we go, huh? Dave, did we see your house in this uh, this presentation, or is that in part two? Well, he had pictures at ramp one, and then the next pictures were at the Mansfield Bridge, so he skipped past my part of town. Well, <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose. Some of the photographers, you know, they don't find some of these areas interesting. Um, and as, as, as much as Ed Miller walked along the lines, he just also took uh, what he thought were representative pictures. And um, Jeff, you have your hand I, I didn't raised. I know that I've ever oh, seen anything sorry, down Jeff. in that area, to be honest. I just moments ago cruised all the way down Fifth Avenue through McKeesport in Google Street View. And uh, those images were all taken in the past two years. So it's very recent. Cannot believe it's the same place. Un yeah. The transformation is unbelievable. Yeah. There are st there, there's still quite a few old buildings. Um, but there's a lot missing and, um, you know, very little active storefronts. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I know yeah. Keysport now has, uh, they had a, a number of buildings, I guess, that were, you know, if not collapsing. They certainly were abandoned. And, you know, the mayor, Trepko, is it, um, has come up with a program to try to get rid of all you know, as many of these old abandoned buildings as possible to, you know, make the remaining neighborhoods more viable. So yeah, yeah they, there's stuff that, uh, it, it's very frustrating trying to figure out. And then of course, that narrower part of Fifth Avenue going toward the hospital, they they rebuilt some of that and adjusted the curve on the street. So you can't even really look at it and say, yeah, there's the curve. Yeah. It's not really yeah. there. And it's not just here. Um, no, it's, it's everywhere. All through Pittsburgh. It's it's even in Scranton, my hometown. You know, the, the stuff is all gone. Yeah. But it I, was uh, still here in the 70s. I remember this stuff from the 70s. Yeah. Sometimes that's how I can place it. Yeah. Hey, George. Yeah. A lot of that stuff across from Goodman's, aside from the old National Bank that's now the City Hall, was torn down in the 70s when I was a kid, about 73, 74, about the same time they made that unfortunate Midtown Mall and tore down Balsamo's. Um, and then the stuff in the next couple blocks until you get to Corson was actually torn down earlier. And that's when they built the Sheraton that became the uh senior housing it's a senior and i think that closed too didn't i read yes it just closed just, that that just closed and i had one last little um thing for you um you mentioned the star restaurant yeah um well in there there's a little bit of history there because in 1947 um a pair of freshmen representatives, one John F. Kennedy and Richard M. Nixon, came up on the b &O from uh, Washington to go to the Penn McKee Hotel and debate the Taft-Hartley Labor Act. Wow. And after they did that, that was the first Kennedy-Nixon debate, they walked up Fifth Avenue, grabbed a late dinner at the Star Restaurant, uh, lounged around for a while, and then boarded the Capital Limited, which stopped very late in McKeesport, uh, eastbound, uh, and shared a double bedroom back to Washington. Wow. What year was this? You said 46? 47. 47. Wow. Yeah. I have got to remember that. That That's a great story. Thank you so much. Didn't there, they, when a, they, when they came the second time, didn't they stay in the Penn McKee Hotel or was that where they had their uh, deliberations? That's where they had, when they came up for that debate, that's where they had the debate. But they literally came up, did the debate, turned around and took the night train back. Um, if you go to Tube City online uh, and go to the history section, there's a good write-up about that. 
Wow. That's a really great story. Yeah, there's some really great discussion tonight. Any further comments? Uh, and the star was open even back then. Yeah. Wow. wow. There was just a comment about the Kennedy statue on Lyle Boulevard. That is the approximate location when John F. Kennedy as president came to McKeesport and gave a speech. Yep. Okay. Wow. Very cool. Any other questions or comments for George tonight? And if you think of one after we end, you can uh, come back in two weeks and ask then. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you again, George. Thank oh, you. Thank again. you. Thank you all for coming. Yes. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you can join us in a couple of weeks and stay tuned to our website for uh, a full summer schedule. We're still working on getting some presenters. I have some further out, but I didn't want to put it on the schedule just yet. But uh, hope to see you guys again soon. Thank you for coming. Have a great night. Thank you, guys. Good night, everybody. Thank